Welcome back, everyone. So remember when we asked for audience participation? We were trying to hope for audience participation. Well, we got some, and I thought we'd share it with you. It wasn't the kind that I was anticipating, you talking to us directly. Um, but someone felt compelled to tag the wall, art does not equal luxury. I'm not sure who that was. Um, but, uh, and I'm not sure, actually, whether this person is saying, because they've chosen to share it with us this way, um, if they're coming down on the side of luxury, saying luxury is supreme over art, or if they are saying art is so precious it can't be commoditized along with luxury. Regardless, we will continue to provoke, um, and hopefully you can share with us in a more direct manner, but we'll take what we can get. Um, and whoever said that might be provoked even further when they hear from Tom Sachs a little bit later, um, an incredibly provocative artist who I'm sure will anger some people. Um, but in the meantime, I'd like to introduce um, one of our next big thing futurists, Dr. Mitchell Joachim. Joachim. Uh, jo 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 Joachim, excuse me, um, who's an architect, a professor at Gallatin. Um, I've just learned that some of his esteemed scholars are Emma Watson and Forrest Whitaker. Um, and he is uh, the director of a nonprofit called, a co founder of a nonprofit called Terraform One, which seeks to um, bring smart design not just to textiles uh, and fashion, as we've been hearing about, but to cities, actually. So please welcome Dr. Joachim. Hi, super great to be here. I am having a ton of fun. So uh, I'm going to show you some of the work that we do in Brooklyn, New York. I'm a member of a 501c3 nonprofit company called Terraform One, and we look at, I think, one of the, probably the biggest luxury items you can think of, uh, the smart city. And we're not exactly sure what that means, but we work on all different aspects of smart cities. We're certainly interested in making them salubrious, places that are about fitness, places that are good for the environment and have a kind of a connection to uh, 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 intelligence and networks that we all carry on our person. And, these are places that would have vertical farms, uh, places where, that are uh, producing amazing things for air quality. Going down the center of some of these areas, we're anticipating climate change and sea level rising. So you'd have a riparian corridor with aqueous life, uh, light rail transit, a uh, city that's mostly walkable because it's the best way to experience a city is on your foot. Uh, and solar panels, et cetera, and we do this kind of uh, work. We also do a lot of work in biology, and I'm going to show that. And uh, another thing we do is explain to folks, not perhaps super intelligent uh, folks like yourselves or people that are aware of what's happening every day in cities, but perhaps Homer Simpson, who's not paying attention to much uh, except for sports, and we try and bring out the abstraction in really uh, terrible and difficult statistics. Things like how much trash do we produce in a given day in New York? So it's around 36,000 tons of waste every day, and I, and I don't know what that means. So we kind of articulate that in, in these kind of sculptural objects and different projects we work on. So this is one hour's worth of that waste, which takes up more than the volume of the Statue of Liberty every single uh, hour in New York. So that would, I, I don't know if it'll change Homer Simpson's mind, but at least it's there and the awareness that we're trying to reach people is, is a part of the project. Uh, we also decided to build a hacker space, a biohacker space from scratch. It was the first of its kind. Uh, it was called BioWorks, and now it's called GenSpace, another nonprofit. And this is a place where scientists and designers work side by side. It was a kind of a fantasy that I had with my roommate, uh, Dr. Oliver Medvedic, at Harvard. He was in the medical school, and I was in the design school, and we just did it really for shits and giggles, and then created all these projects out of it. Now it's blown up, and a lot of other folks are, are working in this kind of uh, environment. So this is one of the things that uh, we had produced. It's a chair grown from mycelium, or essentially the root base of mushrooms. In this case, it's reishi. And we're able to shape and control the geometry of mushrooms. That was pretty cool. 
And we decide to uh, then create a form for it. And we've got many different variations of this one. This is the one that we're productizing. But it is, uh, it's, it's fully grown. The mushrooms in a lab take about seven days. There's a company, Ecovative, that we're licensed to do this work with. Uh, we've been doing a lot of R&D. And then the structural frame is, uh, is bamboo, which is very sustainable and easy to produce and, and fairly cost effective. So we have these fantastic mushroom uh, chase lounges. And there's another version of the chair, a much smaller one. This one's coated in acetobacter. We won a prize for the International Genetic Engineering Machines Competition, uh, thinking about where we can merge mushrooms with design. A poet led the team. It was crazy. We decided a chair would be the final object we would produce. And here it is. That's my uh, daughter sitting on the chair. It is a chair you can eat. You really wouldn't want to, but you certainly can. When you're done with this chair, unlike an IKEA chair, uh, you can throw it, instead of into a landfill, you can throw it into a garden and feed thousands of other forms of life. It contributes to this kind of sense of abundance we find in biology. Another project we were working on uh, was thinking about how we could print cells into different shapes and forms. This is a printer made at, at uh, Genspace. It's essentially everything you see in the DIY maker movement. It's a kind of an open source 3D printer combined with, uh, with a syringe, which is everything or almost everything you need to do in regenerative medicine or, or various uh, lab, wet lab work. So it's a syringe that'll print cells into a specific shape. We actually had a paper that was produced at Harvard when Oliver was working years ago. Uh, this is an earlier project, modifying an inkjet printer to do the same thing, print cells flat and then fold them up into a geometry that's usable. It's called tissue engineering. It's commonly used in medicine to replace uh, your bladder. For instance, if you've had, uh, you need an operation, you can do cartilage in the knee, et cetera. But it makes victimless leather. So essentially, this is a, you're not hurting anything. No sentient creature is harmed. You're printing cells in vitro to make things like uh, a leather belt, a handbag, uh, a shirt, what have you. And it's uh, something that you can absolutely control and author. So we were working with this project really early on as a propaganda piece. How big can you go? Since we worked on making the lab ourselves as designers and architects with the scientists, we knew the limitations of the equipment. We understood how they were working and we were getting to some of the operations at a finer visceral scale. So this is my favorite section in architecture. It's showing the difference between uh, what we're calling the in vitro meat habitat and a typical suburban house. So that, I think, is on your uh, right is the suburban house. And on the left is the in vitro meat house, which is essentially we're using cilia for wind loads, fatty cells for insulation, sphincter muscles for doors and windows, and producing something that looks like this. Uh, we didn't know what shape it would be, but it's this exploration into finding the extended phenotype of humans. Right now, a spider has a web. Birds have nests. Silkworms have silk. But what is the extended kind of uh, uh, place of dwelling for people. And it's a very different kind of organic architecture. It's not your grandpa's organic architecture, which is Frank Lloyd Wright, concrete, glass, and steel, and mimicking nature. It's actually working with bits of nature as they are and thinking about shaping them for our use. And then eventually, a deeper uh, a connection over time. Right now, it's just basically building out things to a certain shape. Here's one of the versions that we have produced with tissue engineering techniques. Essentially, it's this articulated swine leather. It's about $3,000 per centimeter to do this in tissue engineering, which is probably affordable in this crowd, but it's definitely getting cheaper all the time. Uh, Modern Meadows, I believe Suzanne was talking about them the other day, is a company in Brooklyn in the, uh, in the Army terminal working to make this a reality. Uh, as far as more cost effective. So we took this meat house project, we had a big show in Prague, we put it in front of the cathedral so religion could confront the house of meat. And another project we were working on is a little bit more toned down. It was called the Fab Tree Hab. It's taking a technology that's 2,500 years old, which is grafting woody plants together. We're grafting them to form one contiguous vascular system, controlling their geometry to be triangulated and shaped, producing a home or a suburb where there is no distinction between the ecosystem or the landscape and the actual house. And it's kind of taking up a piece of the land and living underneath it. And underneath you could have plaster and your TV set and a nice bed, but outside is the outside. All kinds of critters and things go on, and that is kind of the point. 
It is, a, it is a home that is connected to the Earth's metabolism. It's something that you actually grow. It is a completely living organic structure, and there's no genetic modification in something like this. We use scaffolding and computer geometry to control how these vines and woody plants weave together, connect them to a primary structure, such as a tree, and you get a whole home created out of just, uh, I would guess, nature itself. The point here is that it's a positive contribution to the ecology. It doesn't uh, take away things. It actually is accountable for the uh, industrial pollution that we've already created. It helps scrub the air. It produces oxygen, sucks out carbon, and is trees. It does take some time to grow, so there's always some curmudgeon someplace on a blog or whatever saying, I don't want to wait you know, seven years for my house to grow. Why can't we speed it up? It's this kind of culture of affluenza and sense of immediacy that we find. But you know what? If we wait 12 years for a bottle of scotch, I think we can wait five to seven years to make homes that fit into our environment. And the, thank you. And this, this last project uh, is, is, a, is a view of population. And that's us. We're winning about uh, every day. There's more and more of us. We're expecting to reach 10 to 11 billion humans on the planet Earth. And that's pretty scary. I don't know what that looks like. Neither did the team. So we produced this project for the Venice Biennale, which is considering the world as one population all together, all of our cities connected, not separated by geopolitical boundaries, not separated by nation states. We all share the same resources, and what would that look like? So we used a combination of biology and also old school techniques to produce this uh, uh, cardiographic map of the future that looks at all of population growth. And it was important to work with live E. coli is it's very difficult to work with live populations of almost anything else. And this gave us really rapid feedback and produced wonderful kinds of uh, uh, almost like drawings or maps of what we would get in those future cities with the population changing. So this is a short video, and I think I'll end up... In the next 100 years, we can expect human population to reach 11 billion people. Is this something that is sustainable? The largest amount of people on this planet Earth live inside this circle. We use the Buckminster Fuller Dymaxion map to take a view of the world and look at the 25 densest cities on the planet Earth. Our biomap displays population density as a parametric graph on the front. The back zooms in on each of these cities designed and built and grown inside petri dishes. We chose colonies of E. coli as a method of analog computation. Population density was represented in two different forms of bioluminescent E. coli. Red represented future projections of population density, while green represented existing conditions you would find in cities. Biology is technology. We use the dilution method to show the range of densities of E. coli populations in each petri dish. Stencils derived from CAD files would shape the E. coli into specific geometries that would show or display the current conditions in cities. We wanted to move away from the current paradigm of studying population through computation. We wanted a different method to explore how humans might affect the Earth. Cartographers, urban planners, biologists, and architects all working to think about a map of the near future of human population. Okay, super. Thanks very much, guys. We'll see you out there.